my old ass needs to get on a treadmill because I am already winded just going back and forth up here a few times. Uh, but I'm out here at the OHV park in my Jeep Patriot, which the Jeep Patriot is not exactly the ideal car to go in an off-road park in, but the off-road park is about the ideal place for me to talk about the largest tire size that you should consider running on your Jeep Patriot, regardless of what year it is, regardless of whether or not it's lifted. If you're just here for a quick answer and then buzz off, that's fine. I'll give you the answer right up front. And that's 29 inches diameter by about nine inches wide. And I know that's not the numbers you're used to seeing for tire sizes. The reason I'm giving it to you that way right now is because it depends on what wheel size you have. So for example, if you have 15 inch diameter wheels, that's gonna be different than if you have 16, 17, 18 inch, etc. wheels. Now in all cases, it's gonna start with 235. That's a little over nine inches. And so the largest width tire you're going to want to go with is a 235 millimeter wide tire, a little over nine inches. As for the diameter, it depends again on the wheel diameter. So for example, in this case, I have 15 inch wheels and that means they're 235, 75R15. 15. 15 means 15 inch wheel. 75 means that the height of the tire is 75% of the width of the tire and 235 means the width of the tire. So this ends up to being about a 29 inch diameter tire that's about 9.3 inches wide. If you had a 16 inch wheel instead, you'd be doing 235, 70, R16. If you have 17 inch wheels, that means 235, 65, R17. If you had 18 inch wheels, 235, 60, R18. And if you had big old 20 inch wheels, 235, 50, R20. Because remember, we skipped 19. I don't think they make a whole lot of 19 inch wheels. You might be thinking like, hey, that's some bull. I've seen someone put bigger tires on a Jeep Patriot. And you're right, it is possible to put bigger tires. Possible doesn't necessarily make it a good idea. As an example, let's take a look closer. On here, there's a lot of room behind this tire, and there's a lot of room in front of this tire, and there's a fair amount of room on top of this tire, and the suspension travel is not really all that much. So in back here, hypothetically, you could put a considerably larger tire on here and not have it rub. A lot of people also do modifications to the inside, like this is all just plastic liners. You can trim it and get just, you know, fractional amounts more space. Up front, it's a little bit different of an equation because now the tire turns in addition to moving up and down. And so you have to not only consider the radius of the tire where it fits static, but also when it turns. For example, up here, it gets relatively close up in this area. Again, this could be trimmed. When you turn the other direction, you can see that the tire gets relatively close to this piece of the fender well liner. And this, of course, is just plastic, but behind that is a matching metal seam called the pinch weld. And that's just where a couple parts of the car's unibody substructure come together and get pinch welded during manufacturing. It is possible to hammer that flat and cut this away and have a little bit more room to clear a tire. However, there's another place up here where you can't really do that. This is the lower spring seat for the strut, and so when the tire moves up and down because of suspension movement, this moves with the tire. What that means is this amount of space is pretty much always guaranteed to you, but it's not actually all that much space, and if you start getting a larger tire, you'll end up rubbing, especially as the tire surface deflects and deforms while going around corners. So you don't actually have a ton of space here. Another problem with this, if you want to try and put a larger tire in, is that if you do a suspension lift with the car, this always stays the same distance, meaning that the suspension lift takes place further up. It doesn't take place in this location. So even if you lifted the car, you still can't realistically put a tire that's larger than this clearance allows. Now you can move the tire farther out by putting spacers in, but that increases the scrub radius of your tire as you go around corners, and that makes your handling worse. It makes it a little bit harder to get a good alignment, and it also makes it so this distance is even more critical because the tire swings in a larger arc as you steer. Now that we've looked at the dimensional concerns and why, like technically, maybe you could fit a little bit larger tire on there if you really wanted to, let's talk about why you might not want to. Uh, the first reason, and this is kind of the most basic one, is that there's just no problem with this tire size. You can put them on and there's not any kind of weirdness. There's not any rubbing or scraping or cutting the tire up or anything. It, they just mount on and then you recalibrate the speedometer and you enjoy life. So that's the first reason. It is dead simple. The work's already done for you. The second reason is a little bit more technical, so put on your thinking cap and let's kind of look through this together. The Jeep Patriot is a Mitsubishi Outlander that Jeep already kicked up a notch from the factory. That's not a hyperbolic statement or some sort of simile or metaphor or anything else like that. It's actually a Mitsubishi Outlander that Jeep already upfitted to go off-road a little bit better than the Outlander did. 
Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, Stellantis, FCA, that that whole company has a longstanding relationship with Mitsubishi and, of course, have traded marquees over and over throughout the years. And when Jeep needed to have a light-duty, lightweight, high-gas mileage, inexpensive little four-wheel drive thing to go around in, they didn't yet have the relationship with Fiat, so they couldn't borrow Fiat designs. So they took the Mitsubishi Outlander, which itself is based upon the Mitsubishi Galant platform, and they made the Patriot. So with a lot of conventional four-wheel drive vehicles, the kind of logic that most people take is it was engineered with this basic four-wheel drive platform from the very beginning, and there's always a little bit of leeway. You can always kind of modify things a bit. So if they started here as a four-wheel drive, I can bump it up a notch and not really suffer a whole lot of consequences. In the case of the Patriot, it started down here as a Mitsubishi Galant. And then they kind of bumped it up a little tiny notch to make the Outlander. And then they bumped it another notch to make the Jeep Patriot. So you've already been bumped up a couple notches from what it was originally engineered to do before it even left the showroom. That doesn't leave really a lot of room for you to bump up any more notches. And so part of those limitations that you bump into are that this is a front-wheel drive car platform. It has a little four-cylinder engine that doesn't make a ton of torque. It has a very compact transmission because there's not a lot of room for a four-cylinder engine and then also a transmission and then also the wheels and it's a pretty narrow vehicle. So there's just not room for a big beefy transmission in there. There's also not room for a low range transfer case in there. They're not gonna do exotic stuff and packaging like you would put into something like a Bugatti or a Koenigsegg or something like that. It's pretty standard fare up there. So you've got a pretty decent four cylinder engine. I know people complain about the power, but it's a four cylinder engine making 170 something horsepower without a turbo. That's actually pretty good. It's got a decent four cylinder engine with a little bitty transmission and no low range transfer case. What that means is that your maximum crawl ratio, that's the gear ratio between how many times the engine turns versus how many times the wheels are going to turn, that's somewhere around 17 to one in its best effort condition. You may have the trail rated version, that's going to have a couple badges on the outside that say trail rated, it'll have factory tow hooks and factory skid plates. And that's got a maximum crawl ratio of 19 to one, which means that when the engine turns 19 times, the wheels turn one time. And that means that you've got 19 times as much torque available at the wheels as the engine is able to produce. Best effort. With the automatic transmission that I have, that's the six speed conventional, it's closer to 17 to one. With the manual transmission that was available on these things, it's closer to 15 to one. And that means that you've got not a whole lot of torque available at the wheels. And the reason that's central to this topic is that the larger a tire you have, the worse mechanical advantage your engine has against the ground. So you might be able to drive up something very steep with small tires because you have a great gearing advantage with that smaller tire. Whereas if you start trying to climb up something with a larger diameter tire, you don't have quite as much gearing advantage. On a car that has a low range transfer case, you've got a lot more gearing advantage available to you. Another part that makes these a bit of a challenge is that these cars don't have locking differentials and they don't have limited slip differentials. They have really good traction control. However, that traction control works by stopping the tire that's spinning freely and then sending the torque over to the other tire. Because of the way that differentials function, if you stop one of the driven tires and allow the open differential to drive the other tire, that tire tries to drive twice as fast but with half as much torque. What that means is that unlike a conventional four-wheel drive vehicle that may have a low range transfer case, may have a locking differential, this is at twice a disadvantage. This car is at a disadvantage first in the lack of a low range and second in the lack of a way of distributing torque equally among the tires. The traction control on these cars is fantastic, but it has a very firm limitation when it comes to torque delivery. And the summary result of that is you might be driving along a regular dirt road and then just not be able to make any further progress. You'll be pressing on the gas pedal and your revs will be rising up until they get to the stall speed of the transmission and then you'll just be stalled. You'll be cooking the transmission's clutches, you'll be cooking the transmission oil and not making any progress. If that happens to you, I'd advise you to stop just leaning on the gas because it actually is bad for the transmission to do that. And of course that leaves you in the position where you have to try and come at it with some speed. And that's just how you break stuff. So these are really good little cars to get out into the woods a little bit and to go camping and to go exploring. I enjoy mine. I could get a better 4x4 if having a better 4x4 was a priority to me. I just really think that we should all be realistic about what we actually have. This is a great little economy vehicle. This is a great appliance vehicle that's better off-road than most other cars its sort. But don't let the creased sheet metal fool you. It's still a Mitsubishi Outlander. Did you ever read
volunteers can't exist. Live life a penny, he'll freak out. Speak not a quarter, what he wrote, but a pair of friends. Make it up as you go, guys, you're so sad. Highlights, yes, but don't underline them. Just look for now, like Gloria Stein. I'm the life is like Mary and Barry. It's not all that's cracked up to be like Fred Sanford. When the big one comes, find a meaning of it. Is there is not. It's 24 hours. When you call it a day, be frank and say, I did my way. Don't give a fine, no, no, don't give a good, you just have more fun. When a well oiled bitch, you hit never get your perfect. Can't figure out what the world is a dumper, so let someone else change it. So you can just put bigger tires on and go for a drive, right? You're done. Nothing else you gotta do? Well, I mean, kind of technically, but not really. The speedometer doesn't really know what your new speed is going to be because the speedometer is based on a number of revolutions per mile that your tires are doing. And if you put bigger tires, they revolve fewer times per mile. That's kind of how that works. And so if you put a larger diameter tire on, your speedometer is going to be wrong. A lot of people just do that and they live with it kind of half-assed if you ask me. The other part is that Jeep Patriots have an electronic throttle body. That means that there's not really a cable between your gas pedal and the engine. That's all software controlled. And the transmission is also software controlled. And they rely upon the amount of load that they're expecting to see in order to do their job their best. So you'll end up getting much worse gas mileage with larger tires if you haven't calibrated the speedometer for it because the car doesn't know how to work with the tire size you have and it thinks you're always driving uphill or you're always pulling a trailer or you're always going against a headwind. It doesn't realize that you're just going your normal speed but the wheels are turning slower to get there. Thankfully, fixing it is actually pretty easy. You need two things. You need a phone of some sort or a tablet and you need a dongle of some sort. These dongles here represent the uh, cheapest one that I would recommend and the best one that I would recommend. As for the cheapest one, this one is made by BAFX. This is an OBD2 dongle you can get for around $25. I'll put a link down below for that. And the best one I'd recommend is the OBD Link MX Plus, which is closer to $150. The difference between the two of them, the cheaper one does not work with iOS. If you don't have an Android phone, you won't be able to use the cheaper one. This one also only works over Bluetooth. There are some protocols. Don't worry, they're not involved in this particular vehicle, but there are some data protocols it doesn't do. And it's also just generally slower, in my experience, to do everything. It still works. You don't have to spend the extra money on a Patriot if you have an Android phone or tablet or can borrow one from a friend. Uh, but yeah, it's cheaper for a reason. The better one, like I said, it's like five times the price, so it better be better. Works with iOS, it works with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. It's a lot faster, and it also covers a larger number of protocols. Um, it's physically smaller, I'm not sure how much that matters. And it also comes with a software suite of its own. Not specific to Jeep, but still kind of nice to have. In addition to the hardware, you also need a piece of software called JSCAN. That's J-S-C-A-N. You can get from jscan.net. You can also download it from whatever place you normally get software for your phone. You're not an idiot. You know how to work with that. So how does JSCAN work? Well, let's go ahead and plug in the adapter to the OBD2 port, which I think is somewhere around here somewhere. So I'm just going to do that by feel. Uh, cram it in there. And that's connected. And then I'm going to go ahead and locate JSCAN on my phone. JSCAN worked with Jeep, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, etc., different vehicles. So you just locate the Jeep Patriot on here, Patriot MK. It's asking for permission. I'm going to tell it yes. There we go. I've connected to the adapter. It's showing my VIN number. It's showing a little bit of basic information about what it's connected to. You can mostly ignore that stuff. It's got a dashboard that would let me see stuff like real-time data from all the different modules on the car. It's got modules which lets me do tests on all the different parts of the car, like the all-wheel drive system. The analog brakes, it lets me do all sorts of diagnostic stuff. It also does one called adaptation. On adaptation, these are all labeled. Daytime running light settings, ignition key programming settings, lights conversion, lights voltage regulation, miscellaneous settings, tire and axle settings. On here, I can turn off ABS and electronic stability control if I was really stupid. I could change whether or not I had a locker. Well, it's not quite that easy. It doesn't magically create a locker for you. This is stuff that you probably ought to leave alone for the most part. However, at the bottom, you'll see it says tire size. I can click on tire size, and it's going to read the current value that I've got saved in there. Tire height, 28.76 inches, because that's what tire height, these tires say that they wear from the manufacturer's website. From the target value, I can drop this menu down and I can choose a different tire size. A bunch of little presets are kind of already in here, but you can pick pretty much any size you want to. After you've selected that tire size, you can press the go button 
and it will publish that tire size information to the ECU of the car if you have a license. And then you wait like 20 seconds, it'll tell you when it's done, and you unplug it, go for a drive, enjoy. There's nothing else you have to do on there, so it's pretty painless. Uh, if you're qualified to dress yourself in the morning, I think you can figure it out. Now the part that I would advise you is there are some other modules in there that if you poke around, you could probably get yourself in some kind of trouble. Don't say I didn't warn you, but the tire size one I think is pretty safe. Kind of stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to, if you know what I mean. Anyway, I hope that this has been helpful. If you have any questions about the Jeep Patriot platform in general, if you want me to go in depth on anything, please let me know in the comments down below. I'm happy to help.